Hey fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well. Today I have an honored guest, a guy I follow on YouTube. He has great shoe reviews, everything from basketball to sneakers to uh, slides even. And for you guys, tennis shoes. I mean, his tennis shoe reviews are excellent. He's a certified podiatrist, foot doctor Sack. You might already follow him, but welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Cool, man. So let me know, how did you get into this? Like you're a college tennis player from uh, the beginning, right? Yeah, see, I played in college. I taught all through college in the summers. That was like my summer job. And that's originally what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a tennis instructor. And uh, I ended up getting into podiatry, into foot and ankle medicine, and kind of I wanted to start finding my way back to tennis and trying to make a career out of it. And that's kind of how I found that you know, cutting tennis shoes open uh, during the pandemic. Uh, that was kind of when I started doing it. I actually, my first videos, which I took off, they're unlisted, but they were instructional tennis videos and they were about the worst videos you've ever seen. Uh, I should probably, I should put a, pull them up at some point and show people they are so horrible. But uh, that's how I started, did a shoe review on the Adidas Stycon, the laceless one, and that one did really well. And so I started just going down that path and turns out, and people want to hear from a podiatrist before they buy a shoe, so go figure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think also there's more and more space in the, I mean, there's more brands, more shoes being released, I guess. I mean, in rackets, which is kind of my home, it's also like the, the amount of rackets released every year is just increasing, it feels like, because, you know, they that's the way to make money, you know, with the Yeah, it's got to be something so, new, you know. Exactly, something new, and, and that now there's more collaborations as well in between brands as well. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's pretty cool. And you, you still play quite a lot, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I try to, I mean, I was playing a lot, uh, you know, a few years ago. It's been less and less since, you know, I have a full-time job, the YouTube channel. So I, I still play a decent amount, but I always have a new I'm always testing a pair of shoes when I'm playing. I very rarely play now without a new pair of shoes on, which I guess isn't a great thing. Uh, but I always just, I'm going through the courts and I'm like, well, I've got a pair of shoes in here. I might as well just take my GoPro and shoot. So, I mean, a lot, you, if, if people watch my videos, probably see a lot of the videos are pretty loose. Like when I'm, when I'm playing, there's not a lot you know, I'm not like structuring them well. So a lot of it is just for me going out and hitting and that's the footage I'll use. So yeah, I mean, I still play a, a decent amount. Um, I mean, my strokes are much better now than they were in college. I'm just heavier now. So, you know, it's like the, you know, someone's like, you know, adjusting the dials, right? You know? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. And I mean, I was going to ask about that because I also test shoes from time to time. And I know with rackets, it's pretty bad for your game to be playing with different rackets all the time and you feel like oh, you're, yeah. you're playing worse, you know, and new racket, new string. Uh, but for your foot, I guess it's not so good to also have new shoes all the time. No, and that's why a lot of pros don't change. And a lot of pros don't change. They actually get a medical exemption for their mm. to not change shoes because it hurts their back. And, and it's legitimate because um, I know a few companies had asked me uh, – I, I, I consult with some with some sneaker companies on some things, and and they've come to me and said, "Are these medical exemptions legitimate, or we should or should we get our players off of them, you know, and just make them update the shoe?" And the 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 risks of low back pain are are real when you start doing that because as you start adjusting the stack heights of the shoes and the drops of the shoes, that's when you can bust an Achilles tendon, or that's when your low back can start to hurt. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of that going on. And that's why when you see, uh, like runners, like marathoners, um, especially in, in like the elite running space, these companies will make the, the race day shoe and then the trainer shoe, but they'll have the same profile so that mm, the too. runners aren't changing up their shoes, their cadence isn't switching. So they're not getting the, the back, the shoulder, the, the leg pain. And it's the same for tennis players. That's why. You know, Belinda Bencic was using the 9.5s all the way up until she switched to Asics because, you know, it, it's hard. You get used to something. Your body gets used to something, especially when you're going up for a serve. The timing on your serve, especially when you're a professional, is, you know, within, you know, tens of millimeters, right? And if the, the shoe is changing, a lot of times uh, that that's, that's affecting something. So that's why you see a lot of players stay with their same shoe. It's not because the updates are bad. It's just that 
they don't want to lose that competitive edge to somebody else. So, Yeah, and I guess it's like also tough for them to have time to evaluate part of the new shoe, get used to the new shoe. And mm -hmm. some shoe updates from what I've seen, although I'm not an expert, is like they're quite drastic. I mean, sometimes they're very small, but sometimes it's quite a drastic change, right? Well, and, you know, there's the, there's, you know, you're, you know, you got like the devil on one side and the angel on the other, right? You've got the public that wants to see an update that they say, well, this yep. is trash because all they did was change the uppers or all they did was change the, the lace line. Then there's other people that are saying, well, how come we didn't change the shoe? All you did was do this little thing and uh, you're just trying to grab money. You know, there's people that want the update. There's people that want the shoe to stay the same. So how do you marry the two? And that's why you see a lot of companies do the, like Adidas right now is doing the Ubersonic 4.1 or the really like soft barricade update they just did. Whereas they made these little tweaks on the barricade and changed the whole shoe. I mean, it, it's, it went from like a three out of 10 to a 15 out of 10 just changing the lace line and just putting a little bit of rubber on it. That's it. Um, so you can get great updates on shoes by just tweaking a little thing, but a lot of times companies feel they're forced to completely re reinvent the shoe because the public wants to see them putting in money into R and D when is a lot of the times you don't really need to. I mean, honestly, if you put Cushlon foam in the air oscillate, you could still be playing in Pete Sampras's shoe right now, you know? Yeah, that, that lead, leads me to another <clears throat> thing I thought about, like how much have, I mean, with rackets, the last 20 years, it's not been like a huge change in many ways, but there's still small upgrades. And some brands, like you say, with the shoes, they, they might, for example, head, they tweak a little bit. They just update a little bit because they mm -hmm. feel like we have something good. And then there's Yonex, for example, who make a drastic change every time they release a, an upgrade to right. a line. Uh, maybe because they're like, you know, internally forced or feel like they want to do that or, or something. But for, for some players, it can be difficult because if you love a certain, you know, product and then suddenly the upgrade is so different that you can, you know, you need to stock up, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that that's, that's becomes like an issue. Yeah, I, you know, there's people that at least I know that will bulk buy anything like the nike gp turbo is a great example that's the best shoe that's come out in probably the last 20 years you know that is wow. like it's the complete shoe and then nike stopped making it they still make the women's version which if you're a male player you can just buy the women's version one and a half sizes up it's the exact same last of a shoe but why the shoe sells great it sells out even on the women's because a bunch of men are using it too so you got two you got two genders going in and buying the same the one shoe um, and so like, I mean, technology hasn't gotten that much better. It's the way they use the technology is a lot better now. Um, it, the, you know, obviously shoes are getting a little bit more supportive these days. The foams are getting a little softer because we're playing longer. We're playing harder. So that, I mean, obviously that's, that's the case, but I mean, especially in the Nike space, I mean, Air Max and Zoom Air have not changed in a long time, nor do they need to, right? It's Air. How, how are you going to, what, what else are you going to do to Air, right? So, yeah, I mean, the old court ballistics that Rafa had back when he first started, they're still fine. I have a pair of them right now, as long as the foam doesn't start to crumble on them. I mean, there's no problem where. And then, like I said, the old Air Oscillates are fine. If you could find a pair of dead stock Adidas Barricade 2s, that'd still be one of the better shoes out there. Um, so, no, I mean, and like I said, I mean, Nike just came back with the 9.5s, you know, that, you know, how old are those shoes? And yet look on tour and a bunch of people are playing with them. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that was a shoe. I think it's also now, you know, public opinion is kind of swaying the companies a bit more because of social yeah. media and so on. So like they, they feel like, you know, partly pressure, but also there's obviously financial gain to bring back Vapor Tour 9.5 because then they know they will sell because there's so many fans of that shoe, right? It's just mm -hmm. a a shoe that many people like. Uh, one thing, I went uh, with Adidas to, to the French Open uh, a week ago, and we discussed, because my friend Henrik, he, he raves about this Soul Court Boost that I haven't tried yeah, myself. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the second best shoe in the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's something we, we told them, the designers there, like, you know, this is something that we would like to brought back, and I've heard from other people, they like that shoe. Uh, so, so then they, you know, they listen. I don't know what's going to happen that, but they, that is kind of feedback they now need to take in a little bit more than, than before, I guess. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is, is, uh, 
what was it? I think it was the movie Midnight in Paris with Owen Wilson, where they kept going back in time yeah. to like the times they liked more. And I and that that kind of happens now with rackets, with shoes, especially in especially in the basketball space. This happens way more. People like the stuff they grew up on, right? So everyone said they loved the 9.5s. And when the Vapor 10, the Vapor X came out, everyone hated it. It was the worst shoe ever. It was just trash. Nike's taking our money. And now look, everyone's crying for the Vapor 10 again. Everybody wants that plastic shank. Everybody wants the aggro crag tread pattern. Everyone wants the integrated lace eyelets again. Everyone's moaning and complaining now that the 10's gone because when the Pros came, the Vapor Pro. Now the Vapor Pro 2's out. Oh, the Vapor Pro is the best shoe. Meanwhile, at the time, look at my comments section. They were crucifying me for putting it in the top five list, right? They hated it. So it's, and you're starting to see it now with the barricades. They updated the barricade. It's a clear upgrade. It's clearly a better shoe. Nope. That old barricade was the best one. Meanwhile, in the comments section, everyone's telling me how they ruined the barricade line. So everyone just, people just get stuck in their ways. People think that the, you know, that one generation past is always like the best generation, right? Like our music was better than yours. It's the same. And, and it extends even crazier in the, like I, I start doing basketball shoe reviews from older models and it, I mean, I mean, I think I swear people are like going to find each other in real life and start going to blows over these shoes. So it, it is a little bit of nostalgia kicking in there, I think. So to, you know, a little bit, people can't get, people can't stay objective about a shoe. So. No, I, th I think it's become also connected to a favorite player, for example, mm -hmm. or a, a time in their life. You know how nostalgia works. Like, okay, I remember this time it was just such a yeah. great time in my life. And I used this shoe or I played with this racket or this kind of apparel. Uh, so I, I yeah, think that's that why I mean, that's why I hold on to the Reebok Fig Jam. I mean, I still have this thing. Objectively, that's this cool. is not a great shoe, right? I'd buy 300 pairs of these now if Reebok started making them again because I remember when I was in high school and Andy Roddick won the U.S. Open, and you know he was my idol, still is probably. Uh, and you know, I, you know, I mean, the Fig Jam is a bulky shoe that doesn't really do much well. Yet, I'd play in this every day. So I mean, that that is you know that that's a huge thing. Yeah, that, how big is your shoe collection? Do you have like a crazy amount of shoes? No, I don't really have any shoes. Uh, <laughs> these are all cut. I mean, I have a bunch of cut open. Yeah, you shoes. cut them, right? <laughs> yeah, I have. I have a few that like I really, I really like the Fig Jams. Obviously, I have the Sampras Air Oscillates. I'm still looking for a pair of the Match Day pumps, the recent ones. I have the old Reebok Match Day pumps right there. Those and are cool. Then, yeah. Yeah, I actually have these ones, which have nothing to do with tennis, but I have the old soap grinding shoes back from the 1990s. And that's really it. I have, I have Billie Jean King shoes, and I have a pair of Roger Pros, the um, the hardcore and the clay version. But really, that's it. Everything else I either cut open, I give to people, or you know, I do something with, you know. Do you get some comments on the on the cutting of the shoe? Do people be like, "Oh, what are you doing? You know, you're ruining a your shoe here." Do you get some? Oh yeah, feedback. I would in the be. It's odd. On Instagram, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, I get the, you know, the really heinous comments on YouTube because it's more long form and people start to see where the 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 cutting of the shoe is going and why I do it. I don't. I hardly get any comments about it on youtube it's on the short form where it's like i'm just showing the shoe real quick showing the inside here's the main bullet points people go crazy that way which i don't understand because it's not like i'm spending their money on the shoe and honestly i'd rather be able to keep the shoes and wear them and show them off and like do you know have a collection or even resell them god i could resell some of these basketball shoes for three times what i bought them for a few years later but you know it <laughs> In terms of intellectual honesty, a lot of times a company will say this certain thing is in a shoe and you go and look and it makes up about this much of the shoe. So it really has nothing to do with the performance of it. And so I want to know that before I recommend it to someone in my office because that's why I was cutting them in the first place. So I could recommend shoes to people in my office. I wanted to be a, a, a podiatrist that catered to tennis players. That's why I started this whole thing in the first place. You know, that's what I wanted my career to be. And so if you don't know what's in the shoe, really, because a lot of it's marketing jargon, if you don't know what's in the shoe, how do you, like, how do you recommend it? 
Like even something like the Adidas Soul Court Boost, right? One of my all-time favorite shoes. The shoe I've probably recommended the most in my life, my professional life to people, is only, I don't know, a third Boost. The rest of it is just EVA. The rest of it is a different type of foam. But it's where they put the Boost that really makes it work well, right? But people think the whole shoe is Boost. It's not. It's just part of the shoe. So people need to know that, right? If they want, you know, people need to know where it is in the shoe and why it, it functions the way it does. Because Boost, Adidas Boost Foam, works a lot different than Adidas Bounce Foam. They're both good, but they both work in different ways. And everyone always asks, why do the Adidas Barricades not put Bounce Foam in there? Well, there's a really good reason. Because they're not supposed to be like a forgiving shoe. They're a very aggressive moving shoe. And you want Bounce Foam for that. You know, if anything, they should put Bounce Pro in it, not boost so that's why i cut them open i think on youtube people understand that in short form content it's also a younger audience um sometimes you'll just get jealous that you know a sh someone else has something that that they want and so they get but yes yeah, i'm not spending anybody else's money besides mine so i don't know why people are getting angry no but i think people would like to get angry these days no matter what especially on on social media so uh, yeah, everyone's looking for like something finding a finding a way, uh, something to be angry at. It's almost like, oh, I can be angry at this stuff. <laughs> so it's good, you know? Oh, I had someone comment. I, for, I, I forget who it was. It was just, I, I saw it and I immediately just, but, but I said, top five shoes for the 2023 NBA basketball season. And someone said, I'm offended you left out 2022. <laughs> okay. I said, I said, does the year have feel? I, I'm like, you know, because I mean, I, I'm I'm sensitive to people's feelings, and you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to alienate people. You know, I'm I'm not a jerk, but I didn't know a year could have, you know, a, a conscious, you know. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's how far that goes, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, people have strange emotions. I think sometimes mm -hmm. with with YouTube, uh, it's that like they feel like they they know a person because they watch a lot of your videos, for example, and then they like, oh, a I know you, but then they also feel like, yeah, I'm sorry. It, yeah, it's called a parasocial relationship. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I exactly. You. Paraso yeah, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. And that's a very strange thing because it's quite new and, and, and they feel like they can say anything to you because they now have this relationship with you and you don't know them, right? You don't know they exist right. partly. <laughs> like it's, well, and strange. also, like, I mean, you, you don't know what's, like, what's bothering so – you don't know what kind of day they're having, what's bothering True. someone about themselves. Like, I get comments – I mean, every day about how much I suck at basketball because I play basketball. I always feel like if I'm going to review a shoe, I might, I have got to do something in it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm like 5'7", right? I am short. I have no business playing basketball, but I do it anyway just to d demonstrate the shoe on someone's foot. And every day people get really nasty comments about how I can't play basketball. That doesn't bother me at all. I care less. But then, like, someone will say something, like, really minor, you know, something else, and I just get, I don't know. You know, there, there's certain things that bother people. You just don't know it. And that's why, like you said, it's, it, you know, people that make these comments, they don't really know you. And so um, that that's, you know, that, that's kind of the, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's an odd dynamic for sure. Yeah, it is. Like, I think I, I did a video the other day. It was like 32 minutes. I put a lot of, like, time into it, uh, which is went way too long. It was just an experiment. But then, like, most comments were very positive. But then you see one guy is like, oh, this was a tasteless video. I'm like, hey, yeah. what? What was tasteless about? Yeah. I, I have no idea. Like, right. there's no constructive criticism, right? No. So what? What do I do? <laughs> I don't know. Those people, I just hide from channel. You know, the the idiots, I just hide from channel. I, I, I want to see it. You know what I mean? It doesn't. It's not doing anything for anybody think... else, especially when your channel is a resource and people are looking in the comments for an answer. You know, because a lot of times, I'm, I'm sure in your comments, I mean, you have a big channel too. I mean, you look in the comments section. Usually, if someone's asking something, there's an answer to it in the, in the comments. So a lot of times, I think like, what? Why are these people in here? Just hide them so other people can find what they need. Because I can't get to every comment, right? So, but other people do. So that's that's kind of how I, I I find it. You know, if it's not constructive to someone else trying to find an answer, then I'm, I'm not I'm not a Mr. Beast channel. I'm not an entertain. I'm a resource channel. Same with you. You know, so if people, you know, so I, I have, I have a, a pretty loose finger in terms of just get, just get out of here, you know. I think that's a sensible, I haven't thought about that, but it's actually quite sensible because then you, you take some headache away from you as well, not having to see that stuff that is completely pointless. If it's constructive, mm -hmm. I, I, I welcome it. I can even rely, okay, I can improve this part of the video, mm -hmm. whatever, oh, yeah. my, for my future. But uh, if it's just stupid, you feel like it's better just to remove it and just not like worry about mm -hmm. it, you know. And then other people don't have to be angry at it either, because some people will defend, I guess, defend you. They're fans of your channel, so they will defend you 
for that from the other person, but it's that's also wasting time for everyone, right? It's mm-hmm. a bit annoying. Yeah, and it's just not the community you want, you know. It's just yeah. not the it's not the vibe you want on the channel, you know. Like especially with with our content, I mean, this stuff is meant to be an escape for other people, right? It's it. I mean, a lot of even though we're doing product reviews a lot of the time, a lot of this is escapism. You know, people are yeah. just wanting to you know see something they're interested in while they're on their break at work or something else, or you know when they're at lunch at school or whatever. And so, why do you want to? Why do you want to have that nonsense? You know, there's just, there's no point to it. You know, especially like with our channels, what is there to get angry about? You know, we're not talking about politics, religion, you know, yeah. No, exactly. There's nothing offensive in a video. It's just like a, right. an opinion about a shoe or a racket right. or whatever, a string. Um, yeah. So do you have any YouTube channels that you watch like a lot that you feel like? Because I, I mean, I've, I've moved from being more like, okay, you know, watch Netflix or something. If I want to watch something, I, I tend not to use my lot of time watching, but now I'm like, okay, this YouTuber, this YouTuber, well, you know, that's YouTube I like, kind of. I, I get the, the the lure in it, right? Yeah, so actually one of the first channels I watched was yours. Because uh, I remember when I first started, I thought, like, oh, my God, like, this guy's got the greatest channel. I was like, I was like, if I get my videos look like this, I'll be, you know, because I, 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 I remember that so vividly. Um, I don't watch a lot of tennis or basketball things anymore because it's my life now and i'm so ingrained in it um i'll watch like if i want in you know if i want to know about a racket you know i'll probably watch you or i'll ask like i'll watch the tennis point youtube channel because like i i can just i know them so i just ask them and so uh and i don't switch rackets a lot like I, i hate switching so i don't you know a lot of times i don't I don't know. I just don't, I don't buy into the newer models, even though they have something good to offer. I just, I, you know, with my smart, game, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm teetering on the edge as it is with my game. So it's like, I got to keep the same, you know, I waited for the head. I waited for head to come out with a radical that played like the flex point for years until I found the one I had now. And I was like, all right, this is close enough. I'll, I'll get this. Uh, but uh, I'll watch, so my favorite YouTuber right now is BKXC, which is a mountain bike channel. I watch Jamie O'Brien, who's a surfer. My wife and I watch him all the time. My wife loves him. And then uh, I'll watch uh, I'll watch Formula One YouTube's channel, but I have them on streaming now. So those are probably my top three. I like John Hill, too. He's a skateboarder. I watch him yep. all the time. So those are kind of like the ones I'll watch now. Uh, so the, the, really the only sports channel I used to watch was Nick Simmons when he was actually doing running content, but now he does like challenge stuff like Mr. B style. That's just not like really my, you know, that's not really my thing. So I kind of did away. I didn't watch that anymore, but, uh, I watch, yeah, I mean, I'll, or I, I like to watch tech channels too. Cause that's kind of where I get all my ideas for my channel. Um, so like I'll watch like MKBHD, Sarah Dietschy, those type of people. Um, that's kind of where I get most of my stuff. But I don't watch any shoe reviews, you know, just because I uh, don't care. No, I, I'm the yeah. same. Well, I, if I, I do, I'll watch. I'll watch. I'll watch wear testers. Uh, they do a lot more basketball stuff. I'll watch them if I kind of want to know a history because they. He's like Chris from that channel is like an encyclopedia of shoes, and his knowledge of the history of sneakers and things like is just. I mean, it's it blows everybody else out of the water. So if I want to, if I've done a review of a shoe and I'm like, oh, I just kind of want to know if I. You know, I try not to watch any other shoe reviews before I do mine because I don't want to sound like them. But if I'm interested in one, that's where I will go. Uh, so I think that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because like I think sometimes I don't want to be influenced either by other reviews. So I, I mean, mm-hmm. when I'm done, yeah, sure I can watch something, but I, I, I will want my own like unfiltered opinion. You know, uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're the same, right? Yeah, because no matter what, as soon as you hear someone else say something, it's it's in your head, especially if it's a more like a hot take or like a spicy take on a, a racket or a shoe, then you, know, you don't want it to color your opinion. I remember I did a handful of racket reviews back in the day and there was one racket where I hated and other people did a, a review much different than mine. And I'm really glad I didn't listen to it. I didn't hear any of it because I just was my un. And a lot of people, a lot of people agreed with me. And I think, a lot of the people reviewing that racket either were getting it for free or were kind of having some sort of bias to it. And so I'm glad I didn't have that in my head and I was trying to match my expectations with what was happening. Um, so yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot of that. 
Yeah, I think so. I think that's smart. I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, you know. And I really like you, you do the, the top five lists. Uh, for example, the, the A6 gel resolution uh, 9, the clay, uh, you gave that a really good review. I, I'm just testing it now. Uh, but it, it's, it's, for me, it's like a, a smash hit shoe, you know. And, I, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm really sensitive with, like, comfort and cushioning. So, for me, that was very good. It's as close to a 10 out of 10 shoe as you're going to get right now in terms of the shoe matching the surface. Like the gel resolution nine is a very good shoe on hard. Like, and a lot of people wear it. They wear, you know, a lot of people wear the eights and it's a good shoe, but on clay, all the tools of it are just, and like I said, it's as close to perfect as, as you're going to get. Yeah, for sure. Did you go to the a six summit in, uh, in, in um, Spain. Yeah, in Spain. I, I know I was not invited. I mean, usually I get invited to some uh, some trips, but I'm not on their radar. So I was like, it was pretty funny because I live here. Like I live in the same city. You live near Marbella. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm in Marbella, so it would be a 10 minutes drive for me to go down see the event. I don't even have to stay in the hotel, so I would be the cheapest guest for them, right? <laughs> but yeah, they um they so I got invited, and I'm in I'm on an Air France flight going and this thing's only two days long right i live in yeah, yeah, Columbus, it's a short one, yeah. so i gotta get all the way out so i'm on a flight going out there and i'm, I'm so i got i've got i had questions that were like uh, like i was able to i was going to be able to talk to novak i was going to talk to all their engineers get all this great content i mean i had a week's worth of asics content ready for the channel i'm flying over greenland right and all of a sudden i see the wings start to do this and start to start spinning the pilot had said that he had smelled something in the cockpit Nothing wrong with the plane, smelled something. They circled Greenland for like three hours, burned fuel, landed in JFK. I flew from Columbus. I'm calling them like, where do I go? There was no flights to get there until two days later, so I missed the whole event. Meanwhile, it ended up being like some food that was dropped by somebody else. in Like it was just rotten food or something like that. But yeah, that's how I ended up not being able to go. So I didn't get the shoes until like, because they were all doing the event. The shoes were supposed to be there for me. I ended up not getting the shoes for like another four weeks. So I ended up being like way late on the reviews of the A6. It was just, it was just, it was an interesting story. It was one of the like biggest disappointments I ever had, but I mean, it wasn't their fault. You know, they were trying to get, they were at three in the morning. One of their reps was trying to get me on another flight, but yeah, that was my experience with the, uh, the A6 summit flying over Greenland while the pilot was trying to find some smell. <laughs> Yeah, oh, wow, that's that's annoying. And also, like, you, I mean, it's um, it's a stressful thing to be flying just when you're circling something. I mean, I've done that too as well over the years. You're like, what is happening? Yeah. You don't know anything, right? What's going on? Yeah, they didn't say anything. They, were, they weren't they were no. saying anything in English or French. So I had no idea what's going on. And they're just, so, yeah. Wow. That Oof. was my first introduction to the gel resolution 9. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I still ended up liking it, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a good shoe. I mean, hopefully next, next time they do an event, uh, we'll, we'll both get to go. But... Uh, uh, no, so I, I think it, one of these things that, that is that very important to you and in, in your work, like that you are the first or, or early with a review. Like, do you notice like that's one of the key things? Yeah, it used to be more important. Um, back, like when you're a smaller channel, you know, back when I was, you know, a hundred, a thousand, a couple thousand subscribers. I mean, that's not small. I mean, if you're a channel with that, I mean, obviously that's the, you know try talking to a thousand people in one room. That's a lot, but you know, when my channel was smaller and I was trying to grow, yeah, it was, and that's what grew my channel. To be honest, um, I, you know, I got a couple of shoes very early when no one else had them. And that's really what helped nowadays. Yes, it, it still does really help, but now I have enough of a, a following that people want to hear my opinion, not to try to be, not to be like, to, be a bragger or anything, but they want to hear my opinion on it. So even if I get the shoe late, um, I still, you know, I, I it, it's still good. It's just that me being a type A personality, I have to have it before, you know, I mean, I check, a, I check a certain list every day for a couple a certain shoes. And so every day I just cycle through it. And so I'm always like the first one to get it because I'm just so type A about it. Right. Like it's almost like, you know, just something in my head just will not let me go. So, yes, I always, to me, in, in my head, it's always important that I'm the first. Is it really necessary? No, not at all. Uh, but now with tennis, because I have, because I get, I work with Tennis Point a lot, they send me shoes that are, you know, weeks away from being even announced. So I usually have the tennis shoes pretty early now. Uh, and so that's nice. I don't have to think about it anymore. 
but um, like shoes like the Roger Pro and things like that 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 are, are harder to get. Those I kind of have to weave around and get. But for most, for the most part, um, yeah, every morning I wake up, I that's the first thing I check. So. Yeah, no, that makes sense, actually. I mean, it's, it's always good to be early. I, I'm, I'm a bit the same. Like, I, I, I used to be a bit more stressed about being first because it helps to grow the channel, obviously, mm-hmm. and, and you, you get a bit more views, probably. But then now when you have at least some following that's like, okay, I want to hear what he says, it's easier to, to be a bit more relaxed because sometimes there's a reason you, you can't get it for some for some now we had the covid thing it was also tough with the with the distribution oh, yeah. of, of stuff right from china so but now I'm, I'm a bit less stressed but i still i still would like to have it first i'm like you i mean like you, you're curious about it because this is the job we're doing so you we want right. to like oh i want to get my hands on it i want to try it um this feels like a natural part of it right well and especially me when when this was my only because for a little bit when my when my wife and i left our pre because we worked at the same practice when we left our practice for a little bit I was the sole provider just doing this channel. And so I better get every shoe. I better get every view I need because this is what's feeding my kid and my wife for a little while. So that was that at that point. Yeah, that was a few months ago. That was really I was like, okay, everything has to be on point. And so I remember. But uh, but then as you know, as things started calming down. You know, now I'm a little bit less stressed now that I'm, you know, doing other things as well. You know, obviously I'm not as, you know, crazy about it, but like I said, my, and with my personality, I'm either going to be doing this like crazy or thinking about something else like crazy. Or, I mean, I'm just, that's just my personality. Like I always have to be going a thousand miles an hour at something. Um, if it's not this, it would be something else. I guess it just keeps me from eating candy or drinking or something. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm a bit the same. Or I have to keep, stay busy. I'm not good at not doing anything. And I think that yeah. that's uh, that's good. Like, do you do your own editing, or you have like uh, people helping you? I, I I don't want to edit, but yes, I do all my own editing. It's expensive to hire an editor, and yeah. you know, for a good one, you're gonna pay because I mean, their time's valuable. You know, they could be working on a Netflix series or something. You know, their time's very valuable, and so. I just I don't have the discretionary income from the channel enough yet to hire one, especially to train one for a while, because my videos get really into the weeds in terms of medical terminology, explaining medical terminology, pointing arrows at things that need to be pointed at. And so I'd almost need to teach them basic anatomy and physiology first then about the shoes that they could just do it on their own. Cause what would be the point in me getting the edit to a certain point and then handing it off? You know, I might as well just do the extra hour of work and get it done and not spend the money. So uh, put it this way. If the channel gets to the point where it's making enough money, I think that I can justify that expense. Then I would love to train, hire one person, train them to do one thing and, do that i don't know if i could do a freelance type gig uh but so far it is the whole foot doctor zach sneaker verse is just me it's i do everything for it so um, i had i've tried a few agents actually like managers agents to to deal with business deals um and it just never really pans out there's a lot of a lot of talk a lot of promise and then i'm not sure what happens but i usually am I usually can do a lot better in terms of brand deals, in terms of uh, working with shoe companies as well as like other companies, right? Uh, When I'm just, it's just me and I can have kind of have a direct line. I'm still looking for a business manager. If anybody's in the audience, I'm still looking for one that can help me uh, with that. But that'd probably be the first thing that I would, would hire would be something like that. I think that that's similar to my situation. I mean, I also do everything myself. I have the website, which is like 10 years old. So it's like pretty good traffic there. And I manage that, like I, you know, code that stuff, all that, all that, and it's it's time consuming. But then, um, like you, I think having a very good business manager who is like very sales driven and and can get good deals, um, that would be great. But it's also tough because you have to put a lot of effort into the whole process, and you need to probably pay quite a lot to have a good one. So, uh, you know, having a mediocre person do a job, I would say sixty percent, where you could do yourself ninety percent. It, it's not right. worth it, really. Uh, well, so and there's I, only I you know, one. yeah, and and I, I mean, I've heard from so many people that say like, if you want to scale the business, you got to hire, and you have to hire well. That's all 
because and, and I, I I agree. It's just that number one, type A, I have a hard time giving up control. I'm also an only child, so I have a really hard time giving up control of anything. Uh, and you know, second, it's it's the bandwidth of even just finding someone and training them. Like you know, like because right now I'm building an email list with people and. I'm thinking, okay, well, I need to start a newsletter. I'm like, well, where am I going to find the time to do a newsletter? You know, where am I going to find the time to do, a, you know, because I'm already starting a second. I already have a second YouTube channel going. And so and I'm doing that. And, you know, where where do you find the bandwidth for it? And so, yeah, I think a manager is a good place to start with that. It's just, yeah, finding someone who's good, you can gel with, you know, that you're not going to have to, you know, let go in 10 minutes, you know, someone that's going to show up and someone that's actually going to understand your business and understand the interest of it. Uh, so I, I think, I think, in, I think the better option would be a partner versus a manager. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, that's the case. My wife has helped me with, with, with certain things. And most of the medical stuff you see on my channel, it's been vetted through her because she's cool honestly a better doctor than i am <laughs> uh, in most things and so i always run stuff by her to make sure so that's really the only you know outside i'll send some videos to friends early to show to see but other than that yeah it's it all is on our shoulders and it's nice because you reap all the rewards it's bad because it can get lonely doing this stuff um you know and it just yeah i think so i know, think it's, the... a lot, it's a lot of weight on your shoulders too yeah i think the some kind of creator community i like this kind of thing when you're talking to other YouTubers, creators who are running their own show, right? Uh, that happened also like last few weeks when I went to Paris. You meet some other guys that do similar stuff, whether it's online coaching or, or they have a YouTube channel about you know something else. But it, you, yeah, at least you get to share a bit of, of uh, stuff you would do normally if you had were like 10 employees or whatever. So you, you're, you're getting right. that community feel where you can exchange right. some tips and see how other people do it, you know, if they have any good mm -hmm. ideas or advice or, you know, I think that's very, very helpful actually. And, yeah, and for the sure. tennis world is pretty, pretty positive overall, you know, so I, that, that's that been in my experience, at least. Yeah, for sure. I mean, unless unless you're talking about a pickleballer, then it gets real, you know, for all those on yeah. audio, that's me banging my uh, fist together. <laughs> that, then that gets pretty, <laughs> that gets a little, uh, but other than that, yeah, it's a pretty, you know, lively, fun group of people. What, what's your take on pickleball? Are you, do you play anything or do you, you know, are you against it or what, what's your your feeling so i liked andy roddick's take on it he was like yeah it's great <laughs> but show me the number one pickleball player in the world getting into the top 1000 on the atp tour is would that ever happen <laughs> you know so that that's i like it because i can play with a lot of other people that i couldn't play tennis with um because my level isn't as high it's, it's like anything else you're learning something new so i like learning and it's a court sport. And so I like seeing how the same shoes that you play tennis or basketball in translate into to pickle. I like that. I also like the fact that it's basically like playing mini tennis, you know, and so you can kind of do that kind of thing. Um, it's more fun than I thought it would be. If I had the choice, I would play tennis, you know, every time. However, there are some times I think, oh, I, I'd rather just do this just for a quick little hit here and there. Um, and I get the appeal for people to, you know, tennis is a lot of fun when you're very good at it and you have a lot of feel for the ball, right? Like most of the fun in tennis comes when you have some feel and you yeah. can start creating some interesting shots. That's like where the fun came for me. In pickleball, it's a lot quicker that you can get that feel of the pickle. I don't know what the hell it's called. <laughs> Whatever, you know, the, the, the ball. Plastic and ball, um, yeah. Yeah, they'll put the ball. And so you get a you get a feel for it because it's a shorter court, right? So you get a feel for it quicker. And so I think people get that sensation like in tennis where you can bend a ball around the net post or where you can hit some pretty interesting topspin or when you can hit a drop volley. Those kind of like dopamine hits you get a lot quicker from pickle. And I think so that's why a lot of people like it. I'll continue to play it because my audience wants it and because – Honestly, I'm looking for any excuse to get out there and move, learn skills, keep youthful in some way, shape, or form. Um, it, you know, I think in terms of the sports I like the most, it's tennis by a mile, basketball, and and then pickle. Uh, but I still do enjoy it. Like I, I genuinely like it. It's just that 
if I had the choice, I would rather work on my jump shot. I would I would rather try to get my twist serve better, you know. So that's kind of the the thing. But yeah, I I do like it. Um, I understand why some tennis players are angry because pickle is taking over their courts. Here where I live, there's dedicated pickleball courts. There's dedicated tennis courts. There's a, a club here that's it's public. You, anyone can go to it. I think they have twenty pickleball courts in like it's in like a on a hill. And then beside it's all the tennis courts. The tennis courts are never being taken. The pickleball courts are always packed. So, well, you know, there, there is a, there is a, a demand for it. Um, and I think maybe that's why I don't hate it or anything, because I've never seen a pickleball player taking a court that I want to play on. So why not? You know, so that, that, that's kind of my take on it. I think there should be dedicated spaces, uh, but can't deny it is, it's a popular, fast growing sport. Yeah, no, no, and it's the uh, same with with paddle, for example, in in Europe, right? Like when the, when you're in the glass cage and you're playing mm -hmm. the doubles, it has similarities. Like it's it you do have some tennis courts removed in places, and then they put like three paddle courts on one tennis court because the tennis court is such a large real estate, right? It takes up so much space, mm -hmm. and I guess you can put even more pickleball courts. But uh, I I'm, I mean I'm trying to be like if you exercise, I'm good. It's good. Like racket sports. We we can all be one family, I guess. It can can be like that, you know. And I, but I did one pickleball video, and and people were pretty much like, I hope this is the last pickleball video you ever do. You know? so, yeah, oh the, yeah, people the, get the hate is real, right? Yeah, it's interesting because now you know, whereas before it was all the tennis players getting angry at me and making pickleball videos. Now it's the basketball players because they're playing on indoor courts and they're taking up court time from basketball players. Now the basketball players are getting angry uh -huh. at them. But basketball is still so popular in the States that it's not to the degree that they're taking over tennis courts. So it's it's never that. Plus, a lot of basketball players like playing it. So I, I see a lot, a lot of people coming through my channel that want, what are the best shoes for basketball and pickleball? It's never what are the best shoes for tennis and pickleball or tennis and basketball. It's always basketball and pickleball. So I mm. think the basketball players are seeing more of this, I think that they, they're gelling with it more than they are other sports in terms. I mean, Kevin Durant obviously is, is owner of a pickleball team. Um, and you know, basketball shoes for an indoor pickleball player are much better than tennis shoes for indoor because of the rubber compounds. So, you know, if you're playing outdoors, you want to wear a tennis shoe, but if you're playing pickleball indoors, you want to use a basketball shoe. And so there's a lot of overlap there. So that's what I'm seeing on the channel. Um, I mean, I'd, honestly, I'd like to do more because I'd just like to get better at it so that I could yeah. offer better advice and better advice. Um, but normally, like I said, normally people that I consult with uh, when I'm doing my consulting work, it's 99% basketball and tennis still. So when I start seeing more and more pickleball players come through my office, and through my telemedicine portals, I think that that's when I'll start playing it more and more. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Why not? Now you do some work with with different brands and, and companies. Um, mm -hmm. Do you get like prototype shoes and you give their feedback, or like you're you're going to the factories and and how is that? How does that feel? Like is that a fun part of the process for you to actually be involved in in some of this stuff? Yeah, I uh, I'm involved in three projects currently. One is a smaller company. Well, not small. It's in, you know, in terms of Adidas, Nike, Under Armour, it's small. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm design. I'm helping design a, a shoe for. I, I have an NDA, so I'm designing a shoe for yeah, a certain course. sport that's not as yeah. big as what we're talking about, and that's a lot of fun. The only bad part is, is like if your name's not on it, it, it you know, you know, I, I kind of would like to be, you know, in the team, but that's fun. Uh, I'm also I consult on a lot of uh, like orthotic stuff, orthotics braces. Those I I do a lot more of that work, um, and I mean I have. I mean if you look under the desk, I have a bunch of ideas for shoes and things people can do. And um, a lot of times companies want that information, but they never want to pay you for it. Yeah, they want to yeah, just yeah, you know let, let's just I, I get this. Let's just jump on a call real quick. I was like okay. You know, so I just send them my, I send them my, the link to my website for consulting and then I don't hear, um, but yeah, I mean, I do get a lot of early shoes, a lot of prototype things. And, um, you know, if a shoe's already made and they want my opinion, they get, sure. I mean, just watch the video. That's my opinion. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been doing more and more consulting for shoe companies, which has been a lot of, I mean, it's been great. That's, I mean, honestly, like when I was in high school and college, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to design shoes. And so I think eventually that's probably where this will end up leading. You know, eventually I'll end up 
making a shoe. Like I said, I have so many ideas and so many little things I work on with it that eventually I think that'll happen. But no, it is, it, it's a thrill, especially when it's a bigger company that sends you something first and you, know, you can't show anybody and you know they're paying you to do it. Um, that's been a lot of fun. I've worked with some really great brands uh, doing that. Like, uh, you know, I, I can say, I mean, I worked with Adidas, Under Armour, Keen, uh, in doing that kind of stuff and never with tennis. It's always with something else. Uh, but that, those have been some really awesome things to do to see the process and to be able to showcase it on the channel too. So, yeah, that's amazing. Um, and I mean, like what I, I went to the, for example, the head factory and, um, you know, they went, went or the headquarters there and they have a, like a factory for pro stock rackets, not for shoes, but we went through like how many, you know, different components there are in a shoe because they had developed their first paddle shoe, right? So, mm. and you know, there's more complications and, and stuff going into a shoe than in a racket, for example. So it's like, it's quite a yeah. complicated thing. Like and there's so many things you can tweak, uh, which mm -hmm. is kind of eye opening to people who were there. But in, in your experience, like it has, you know, the materials, have the materials changed enough for like, you know, have they really progressed over the last five, 10 years with, with the different foams or, you know, is it just a way of using the materials we already have, you know? I don't know. I mean, there's obviously been some huge leaps, you know, in terms of how to make the shoe lighter while still giving the same amount of support. So yeah, there's leaps, but you know, some of the best technology has just come from just thinking, you know, look at head, right? Since we're talking about head. They came out with a way to make the shoe 100 times, I mean, this isn't scientific, but like 100 times more breathable than other shoes. Because all they did was add a cage under the bottom of their shoe. They just added a hole under the bottom of their shoe. That's where most of your sweat glands are. That's where you heat the most. And so, you know, the Head Revolt Pro and the Head Sprint Pro are now some of the most breathable shoes in the market. It doesn't matter what they do in the uppers of the shoe because they have a hole in the bottom of it. Well, that's not a new technology. That's just them thinking about something better and implementing it better. Um, you know, there is like with Nike, with the GP turbo, it was all technology they already had. They just used it in a better way, you know, and for sure companies are learning how to make foam lighter while keeping the same support, right? You're starting to see some of the foams that they're using in ultra marathons coming into the basketball space and they're going to be trickling into the tennis space. And it's because they found a way to make those ultra light foams stable enough for a side to side sport. That's, I think, the biggest leap in technology now is getting the foaming to where it's light, really responsive, really bouncy, have a lot of energy return, but also stable enough for side to side. Because that's why tennis shoes and basketball shoes are so heavy, because they have to be bottom heavy to keep you centered. You can't wear a running shoe. You'll roll your ankle all the time, right? They have to be wider. They have to be hev bottom heavy. And now you're finding these foams that are starting to get bottom light, but they're stable side to side. And that's where I think that's where you're going to see the giant leaps. It's nothing to do with the outside of the shoe. You're not going to see it. It's all internal. But that's where the I think that's where you're going to see the biggest leaps in tech. Very cool. Yeah, I yeah, know. I, I, I'm sure. I mean, there's there's small improvements in, in rackets and shoes and, and everything. Uh, sometimes people are, are you just like they just put that kind of thought away because they feel like, you know, nothing has improved because they have that kind of mindset. But there's obviously, you know, teams all over the world working on this. So there should be mm -hmm. some kind of improvement. It would be surprising otherwise. And I, I also heard that, for example, what you mentioned, that running shoes in technology-wise are ahead of, of, for example, tennis shoes. I guess, I mean, you know, it's, uh, that will come later. Like, we'll have to wait two years before, like, the running shoe technology goes into tennis shoes. Yeah, I, I would say running shoe tech and basketball are, running's got it for sure. But that's because running is, there's one focus right? Yeah. So you can laser focus on one thing, right? Straight line speed. So, I mean, you know, there's some other things running, but the majority, you know, the only things you got to think about in running are what kind of striker are you? What distance are you running? Right? Like what, what is your tempo? What's the pace? How much weight are you putting on the shoe in basketball and tennis? Well, are you a point guard? Are you a center? Are you going up for layups or, you know, do you need a shoe that you can get trampled on with tennis? Are you a baseline? Or are you a serve and volleyer? Do you need a shoe for serve plus one? You need a clay shoe, a hard court shoe. I mean, there's so many different variables. And so it's harder to say, okay, let's focus on this right now. Let's focus on this idea or this problem. Whereas with running, you can focus on the problems a lot easier. Second of all, runners buy a lot more shoes than tennis and basketball players do. So you're just cycling through 
you're cycling through product a lot faster. You're getting a lot more data a lot quicker, so you can um, go up. Also, everyone's a runner at some point in their life. You tell me one person hasn't at least tried to go out jogging once in their life. That's And that's how it trickles down to basketball. Basketball is a much more popular sport, much more popular athletes. So they get the tech first, whereas tennis is not as popular. And so you're, that tech comes last. So I think everything kind of trickles from those two and then it comes into the tennis space. Uh, that's not the case in some companies like Lotto, Diodora, who were like tennis and soccer first or football, sorry, first. And so you see their shoes are sometimes a little, they'll catch up quicker than other companies will. So it just kind of depends, you know, what, it depends on the company. And then it also is, where's the tech trickling down from? Yeah, no, it makes sense as well. I mean, um, one thing I, I was curious about, because my friend has, uh, you know, really bad foot problems, like he's playing a league match in Germany. Uh, we actually hit just before I, hear, before I came here. And, um, and he, he, has, he wanted to ask about insoles, like how important are insoles? Because his, his feet were like so tight, you know, it was mm -hmm. <laughs> insane. Should people who are serious about their activity sport or whatever they're doing, you know, should they do like a gait analysis or something to figure out what shoe works for them and what insole could work? Yes, that's actually what I do in like my physical space now. I mostly have people on a treadmill just seeing their feet move. And that's very important. Force plates are really important to see kind of where they're putting it. But also seeing somebody actually play and seeing what their feet are doing while they're playing. Because some people with a flat foot, especially in tennis, that's an advantage. Because you can get lower to the ground, you're more stable, you're less likely to roll lateral. If you look at the pros, anybody that's playing enough is in orthotics. Because having that strain, that stress strain on your arch, on your plantar fascia, eventually is going to cause issues, whether it be in the fascia, in your legs, your knees, hip, back. So usually you want to bring the ground up to your foot. And that's, what an, that's all an orthotic does. It just brings the ground up to your arch. That's, that's all it's doing. Do you have to have a custom orthotic? No. You know, a custom orthotic is, well, you're in Europe, so let's say it's like a Ferrari versus a you know, a, a, an Alfa Romeo, they're both going to get you to the same place. The one's going to have more bells and whistles on it. Um, most pros are, have, are having custom orthotics built for them because after playing four to five hours a day, every day for 10 years, those little deformities in your foot are going to start to become big ones or feel, they're not going to become big ones, but they're going to feel like big ones. So if you can mold the shoe exactly to your foot, those little nagging injuries become less and less. So normally if someone's playing enough, I usually say, yeah, just get a custom orthotic, bring the ground up to your foot. You will, the injuries will come less. They will be easier to come back from. They're not going to prevent them because if you're doing one thing, all, remember the human body was designed or evolved, whichever you believe to walk on sand or dirt. There weren't any basketball courts in 300 <laughs> BC. There was no asphalt pavers in 300 BC. Everyone was walking on dirt and sand. That's also the big People are all saying, like, I want to wear barefoot shoes to play tennis or I want to wear barefoot. That's fine if you're playing beach tennis or sand or sand volleyball. But the human foot was not designed to, to run on concrete. You have to be an elite, elite, elite runner to be able to do that. Basketball and tennis, you need a little bit of a stack, pickleball too, or you'll load your Achilles tendon so much that you'll snap it. Right? I've seen so many people try to wear barefoot shoes and snap their Achilles tendon playing tennis going up for a serve because of the eccentric wow. loading on the tendon. So, um, I, I usually am putting people in orthotics now that are playing a lot. Are they necessary? No. Do they help? Yes. By that little bit, but over time, that little bit becomes a Canyon, you know? Yeah, that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've done gate analysis before. I'm going to do it again now because I, I, I've had struggles with, with, um, like knees, hamstrings. I play like five six times a week, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite a lot of tennis. Yeah. And it, it comes probably like from what I heard from my physio is like, it's my, my foot is quite arched. So it would really help me probably, but then you keep push, you know, putting it off. But now after talking to you, I'm like, okay, going, coming back because I'm going to the ATP in Germany tomorrow. Um, and after I come back, I'm that's definitely booking it because I, th I think this, 
this is a smart uh, time and money investment to just uh, get something proper if you're playing a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and a thing, it doesn't really matter the brand of orthotic in terms of customs. Over the counter, the brand matters a ton. But in terms of over the counter, it's the person molding it and the decisions they're making, right? Like, do you need a dense foam orthotic? Do you need a polypropylene orthotic, carbon fiber? There's, there's a lot of different choices there. It's the person designing it that that's the real uh like linchpin in there you know in terms of over the counters you can get at the store yeah the brand 100 percent matters in terms of custom it's it's the person holding it yeah and it's a good point you you said about barefoot shoes it was one of the questions i had because i have a friend who's quite you know obsessed with barefoot shoes he's a tennis player he he doesn't play in barefoot shoes but he ran a marathon barefoot uh, which to me sounds like i mean he's not he's a fit guy but he it, it's you know he's 42 maybe um and it's to me i, I cannot understand it. i run marathon when i was like 17 18 and i used to wear like really focus on the shoes running shoes to have good shoes it was mm. 20 years ago but um i have a hard time seeing barefoot shoes work <laughs> you know it's, like... it's so some people can put it this way everybody can benefit from barefoot training as long as you're as long as you're like injury free, you can benefit yeah. from strengthening the muscles in your foot and the leg. Yeah, for sure. And I and I have people go into barefoot shoes constantly. I'm always telling people in certain at certain times, it is not the be all end all that some people will have you think it is. It is not the cure all for everything. You're not going to cure a bunion wearing a barefoot shoe. That's it's a structural deformity. You're not going to cure it. I don't know where that came from, but yes, you can strengthen your arches. You can do this and that, but. I forget who it was that said it. And they said, if you start swimming all the time, you're not going to have the body of an Olympic swimmer. The reason that they can swim in the Olympics is they have the body for it. Some people have the anatomy to wear a barefoot shoe and to be very efficient in it. There are some runners with certain strike patterns, with certain leg lengths and just body habitus that are perfect for a barefoot shoe and they probably are more efficient in a barefoot shoe for sure. And those are the ones telling you that everybody should be in them. I know from experience just from treating a lot of people that not everybody should be in them. That being said, yes, everybody can benefit from training in them at some, for, at some point for some amount of time. If not, if nothing else, just to be able to get the nerves and the sense in the proprioceptors with the ones that sense the ground in your foot to get a little bit more data on what is underneath of your foot. You'll let, you're less likely to sprain an ankle. Your footwork's going to be a little bit better. Your toes are going to be a little bit stronger. The, the muscles that govern your toes, not your toes themselves, but the muscles that govern them. So yes, training fine. I think it's good. Do a training block in them, understand it, maybe do it here and there. But for most people, you know, in their thirties or in their forties, your joints hurt concrete is not good even clay is not you know it's, it's, it's a little bit unforgiving so that, that that's that's where i stand on it uh, to be honest like i said not tell i'm not a detractor of it i think they're great it's just you know they're not it, it, it it's it's not the panacea that um that some people think it is how important is it for a consumer to actually do their research and find a shoe that works for their foot like i guess some people just buy a you know they buy a, a shoe based on a favorite player or just how it looks i guess yeah i mean i think it's you know are you okay here's the thing do you have a store in your area can you go try shoes on in that case it's not a huge deal most of us now have to buy online yeah and so it becomes a bigger deal because you know yeah a shoe can give you plantar fasciitis a shoe can make you more prone to an ankle sprain most of the consulting I do online now is people looking for the right combination of orthotic, shoe, sock, brace. And you would think it sounds stupid. Like, why are you paying somebody to go shoe shopping? Well, when you're a high-level athlete, it, it it makes a huge difference. And like I said, that, that's most of the stuff I do now. Um, so, yeah, it is pretty important. I have a video out there that shows you how to find the true shape and size of your foot. That's probably the most important thing to do is find the shape and be able to match the shape of your foot to the shape of the shoe. That'll solve 99% of your problems. Most people's problems come, like you said, they're trying to wear a shoe that their favorite pro is wearing when what they don't understand is that pro also has a custom orthotic and they're made by a very competent physician <laughs> and their favorite tennis player or basketball player or pickleball player is also with a physiotherapist, with their trainer, doing a lot of work so that they can wear those shoes, whereas maybe you should be in something 
it's a little more forgiving, something like the soul cord boost, you know, something that's going to help your foot a little bit more. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of pitfalls to it for sure. Is there, you think, uh, a difference, for example, like there are shoes that are kind of performance shoes. You pay, you know, 150 bucks, 200 bucks for a shoe. Yeah. I'm talking tennis now specifically. And then there's obviously the, you know, the cheaper versions, like maybe 60, 70 bucks. Yeah, the takedowns. Um, what are the differences? And, and like, sh should you go for the more expensive model even if you don't have like the, the strain on the shoe, for example? Um, yeah, I, I would say unless you are just messing around with your kid or you're feeding balls like your wife's a professional player and you're just feeding her balls to help out. Then I probably would go for the premium models. A lot of those teardowns or the takedown models, the foam in them is rock hard. The uppers don't have any containment. They're using cheaper materials, so they don't have the side to side capabilities. Coincidentally, a lot of times the rubber is just as good, which is weird. I've seen a lot of budget shoes with great rubber. Why? Um, but yeah, I'm a huge proponent of you buy once, you cry once, or you get what you pay for. Yeah, tennis shoes are not going to last that long. If you're playing really hard and you get four or five months out of good use out of them, you're doing well. And a lot of people don't want to accept that. That's the modern game. We're sliding. You know, we're, we're putting a lot of heat through the shoe. You're doing a lot more everting of the shoe, right? That the shoe is being exposed a lot more. I mean, look at the new Nikes. They all have rubber around their lace line now to protect the laces because people are sliding so much. So to me, you, you get what you pay for. You're going to pay for it some way, either seeing me in my office and getting an injection or buying the, the shoe. I, I just buy the shoe. Um, I know everything's expensive now. Inflation's terrible. I hate it too. Uh, I mean, I hate it the most. I'm the one paying for them to, to get them in. Uh, so, but yeah, the, the more premium shoes definitely do have a, a benefit for sure. Do you have, um, do you see like a, a, a injury more than others? Like, do you see like something that, that pops into your, to your clinic more and more and more? Plantar like fasciitis and Achilles. Yeah. The years, right? yeah. Plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis. That's the, the number ones. Um, you see a lot of Achilles partial ruptures with tennis because of the loading with serving and people trying to serve with barefoot shoes or minimalist shoes. Uh, ankle sprains are probably number three. And then ingrown toenails. You know, people that play court sports going side to side, ingrown toenails. I mean, I can't tell you how many ingrown toenails I've taken out of tennis players, especially ones wearing really tight shoes. They refuse to go get a New Balance 2E when they so clearly have a Frankenstein foot, but they want to wear the, the Vapor 10 which is like this, which well, there's nothing wrong with it if you have that type of foot, but if you got a giant bunion, you need a wider shoe. So um, those are the people that, yeah, I'd say it's it's heel pain, ankle sprains, like, you know, in freak injuries, and then ingrown toenails, a ton of ingrown toenails. I, I really like like the looks of, of uh, the look of Nike shoes, mm -hmm. but I, I get some kind of leg stiffness. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know if they suit, don't suit my foot or something. Uh, is that, I mean, not like, pointing out Nike here, but it's just something I've noticed with Nike shoes that I don't see so much with, for example, some other brands, you know, um, do, do they have like a specific, was it layup or what, what, what could be going on there? For example, it depends on the Nike shoe, like something like the GP turbo. I mean, I, I can't imagine anybody would have too much of it. I mean, there, those, those are the most forgiving. No, I never shoes tried out those. There. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, something like the new vapors, like the, the Vapor Pro 2 and the Vapor 11, it's rock hard Nike Phylon underneath of them. They're, he they're bottom heavy because the rubber is really heavy because they made them for sliders. So they made the rubber flat and just as heavy as you can make it. So it's going to be really hard to lift it up off the ground, right? So those are a little bit more. That's why you saw a lot of pros go back to the Vapor Pro or the Vapor 10. Now, there are some people. Now, if you put those on clay, like the Vapor Pro 2 clay, plays like a different shoe the he the heft on the bottom gives you a little bit more stability on clay especially on like dry kind of eh, clay it also just could be that you don't like the setup of phylon you know you don't like the setup of that foam some people love that dense rock hard type midsole foam there are i there's one i won't say their name but it's a professional tennis player that hated older nike models loves the new ones because they want that bottom heavy feeling. They love it. They have super strong legs. That's what they like. They bought a ton of them. 
And so there's this person saying, no, these are the best things I've ever bought. There's other people saying these are the worst. So it, it usually comes down to your body not matching up with the shape of the shoe, the weight of the shoe, how much it drops, that kind of thing. Um, you know, and Nike gets, like we were just talking about Nike, Nike gets more hate because they're so popular. Nobody is hating on, I'm like, I'm like, I don't want to call it a brand, but like, you know, no one's hating on Reebok tennis because they don't make any tennis shoes anymore, right? It's the most popular shoes are going to get the most hate because most people are playing in them. So um, yeah, it, it's more than likely just a mismatch of the shoes. Because like I said, there are people out there that can only play in them, you know, and that the shoes that I find are the best ones out there they find something wrong with every single one of them on my list and tell me about it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's more than likely just a mismatch. Yeah, I know that that's what a feeling I had. Like my, uh, my physio told me it's, uh, she've seen like, if you have a really strong arch, like some people with that don't like that kind of vapor pro. Mm -hmm. And also I, I may think they look amazing. So I did do play with them. And when I do play tests and stuff and I, I can see that they work for other players and I, I you know I lend them out to friends with the same size you know and you ask them about their opinion but just for me I felt like some stiffness that I didn't feel now I tested a, a lotto shoe that is not out on the market it's coming next year which you probably already tested a long time ago but that's like super comfortable to me for example I never tried lotto shoes before mm. and uh, like the bubble up pro pulse fury 3 for me who prefers playing on clay but this was on hard court model that was just an amazing shoe to me as it felt super foamy and cushiony mm -hmm. but it might not work for someone else right yeah so. for sure oh yeah Babylon makes great shoes uh one of the questions also i wonder is like how much better for your body or you know legs shoes feet is it to play on clay for example than over on, on, uh, on that's flexi pave <laughs> or hard court yeah much better i mean it more mimics what the like the foot like i said what the foot was designed to, to do and designed to go on. i mean God, my body feels a hundred times better when I'm on clay. Um, I, I play with my dad a lot in the videos. A lot of times you'll see my father in, in the, in the, in the foreground or in the background over. And if you watch the videos on hard courts, I dominate on clay. It gets a whole lot more competitive because, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a 60 year old dude and his legs work a lot better on clay and he he's more you know he has more vitality on the clay just because it's not sending the shock up through his knees so yeah if you want to play for longer clay is where it's at for sure yeah i, I agree i mean i also play with my father sometimes in the videos as well and he's 65 so um and and he i've noticed like he has more time on the ball mm -hmm. that's probably he replaced both knees so they're both plastic knees right but and he's just moving like like a much younger guy when he's playing on, on clay mm -hmm. and it's 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 better for him you can see it and i also feel usually fresher when i play two hours on clay instead of two hours on even a plexi pave which is pretty soft hard court you know yeah anything that more mimics sand or dirt shale that is usually i mean that, that's what your body is going to like more because that's what your body wants right that's that's what your your joints want to work on so yeah i mean for sure when i'm you know, I still play on hard all the time because that's what most shoes are made for. But I, you know, when I get into my you know forties, fifties, sixties, yeah, it's I'm gonna I'll probably be on clay most of the time. Grass too. I mean, grass is super forgiving too. It's just a lot more injuries can happen on grass. Yeah, you can slip and slide. I'm. I'm we'll see if I hit some on, on grass now from from the coming days. But I have actually a, a grass court shoe that I got once that I've used like three times because you never play on. <laughs> yeah, on grass. you never use the nubs. Yeah. No, no, so that's that's fun. No, it was a great chat talking to you. Uh, last question is, um, who's your favorite uh, tennis player then? Do you have a, like a favorite where you would be like, I want these shoes because this guy plays with it? Right now? Uh, retired is fine. His well, origin. I mean, all, I mean the, the greatest player of all time is Andy Roddick. So let's put that out there. Uh, so that's not up for debate. Um, my second favorite player of all time, Pat Rafter, for sure. I played with his Prince TT Warrior for years. <sighs> Love Pat Rafter. Um, my favorite player right now is on Jabor. Uh, her, I love her game. I think that's the way the ball comes off of her racket is just like perfect. Right. Um, so she's probably my favorite player right now on the men's or women's side, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, obviously I'm an American dude, so I loved Pete Sampras. Um, but yeah, I mean for right now, like if, if I, if I'm going to go buy a ticket to watch anybody, it, it's probably going to be ons, um, on the men's side. Probably Rublev is probably one of my favorites right now. Just, I mean, just, I love watching him lose his mind. Um, and then <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's Francis Tiafoe. I mean, honestly, like you know, Francis Tiafoe, I'm probably would always be like my, you know, 
I'd always want to see his matches. I, I kind of followed his career for a while. So probably the men's side, it's probably Francis is my favorite right now. Um, and then we have like, we have like JJ Wolf's from our area. So oh, yeah. I like watching him play too. Uh, he's real good. And then, I mean, you, I mean, Carlos Alcaraz is, you know, super fun to watch as well, but yeah, I mean, if, if it's, if it's all time, it's gotta be Roddick, then Rafter, then Ons. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a Roddick fan as well, especially press conferences, but also yeah. <laughs> like he's, he's the funniest tennis player, I would say. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks a lot, Zach. This was great. Uh, I hope everybody liked it. I'm pretty sure they will. There's a lot of good information here. And if you want more information, you follow his channel, of course, if you're not already doing that. He also has a website with consultations. So that's great. That's a great new service. And there's some uh, booklets you have. I bought the PDF for the tennis shoots. Oh, yeah. Uh, it the, was very uh, helpful. The you list. Know. Those so are, I really those like are. that stuff. So uh, big thanks for coming on, right? Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's going to be, uh, it's gonna be fun. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day now over there and, and we'll, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, you too.